Maybe I'll just start with reality, and we'll, and we'll go from there. So um, we all know the world of Facebook. We know people on Facebook that we don't really know. And I know on Facebook this man named Michael Stone, who I've never met, and, but apparently he is a Buddhist teacher, a Zen teacher, and a yoga teacher, mostly in Canada, but some in uh, the United States. He's, I'm using the um, tense actually wrong, but I'm gonna say he's 42 years old. And uh, last Thursday, he didn't come home. And his family didn't understand why he didn't come home. They found him in a coma and he was dead that night. They actually kept him alive somehow on life support until his family came, and then he passed on the next morning. That's the reality we're starting with. 42-year-old man, two young kids, thriving therapy practice, Buddhist practice, yoga practice, well-loved, well-cared about, gone. None of us know the time, none of us know the date, none of us know the circumstance, but that's where we're all heading. That's the truth. I'm often talking about this, that can lead us to fear, that could lead to anxiety, that could lead to giving up, that could give, lead to saying, I'm lost, what's the point? To me, it leads to being alive, right now. As Zen Master Sung San used to say almost every time he gave a talk, nobody guarantees your life. But we live as if it's guaranteed. We all figure, well, yeah, we know it's gonna happen, but it's, it's a long way off. I'm gonna get old, I'll die old. You know, I, I know for myself, being in my mid-60s, I'm kind of in this transition point of recognizing, sometimes I call myself a baby old man, because it's starting. Fortunately for myself and for people who care about me, I'm in pretty good health, but that's no guarantee either. So every time I hear a story about this, it reminds me to wake up now. What's happening right now? To, as my wife will tell me, who's older than I am, to appreciate just what's happening right now. It's such a simple instruction. Appreciate this moment. And we can speak about the beautiful things to appreciate. This ceiling fan has been here about a year and a half now. And it's been a wonderful addition to this room. Right now, I feel the breeze. The air is coming in from the inside. Just the fact that it's 8.07 and it's light out. Just the simple pleasure of being alive. But how easy it is to forget that because of the struggle, because of the difficulty, because of the wanting things to be other than they are. From the earliest part of our lives, we're used to, we learn this feeling of not enough. For many of us, it's I'm not enough. For some of us who don't have that worry, it can be I don't have enough. Or look at that person, they have more. I should have that. Our minds get lost in our own particular riffs. Think about it, what's your riff? What's that kind of negative self-talk that continually shows up? Yours is different than mine because we each create our own. But all of it grows out of circumstance. All of it grows out of conditioning. And what the Buddha taught was there's a way out of that. That we don't have to remain slaves to our own conditioning. That it's possible to step out, 
to be able to live a spontaneous and fresh life. It doesn't mean that everything is going to be good. It doesn't mean we get everything we want. It doesn't even mean we're happy all the time. It just means we're alive. We're not fighting what is, we're joining with what is. Sometimes we call that becoming one. And enter into the moment that is right now. So, 10 minutes ago, I didn't know I was giving the Dharma talk. Fortunately for you all, I can wing it. I've given, I've been answering questions at Empty Gate Zen Center since on Wednesday night since 1984. So that's a long time. And I've gotten used to it. But when I saw it was happening, I could feel the energy in my body change. I could feel the, the foul language run through my mind. <laughs> Rather than fight it, be with it. Become one with it. It's the resistance that makes it worse. We say it takes three things to practice Zen. The first is great question. In Zen, the great question is, what am I? We start off our Zen practice with great doubt. We're not talking about self-doubt here. We're not talking about, I'm not okay. We're talking about, what is this? When Paul was giving meditation instruction tonight, he said, he talked about don't know mind, the curious mind, the mind that wonders. Sometimes we can say, it's the mind that returns to zero. Sometimes we call that hitting the clear button on the calculator, returning to zero. What our conscious thinking mind and feeling mind is very good at is accumulation. <coughs> so if I wake up in the morning and I'm irritable, the first person I meet gets a taste of my irritability. And if that person gives me a hard time, about being irritable, that second person has it much worse. <laughs> and now we're still early in the morning. Imagine what it's like at 8, 11 at night. We just accumulate and we walk around in the fog of that accumulation. And even worse, we believe it. I'm right. Of course I'm irritated. You irritate me. And I can go around the room and explain why each one of you irritates me. <laughs> but you're not irritating me. I'm creating the irritation. You're alive. Yeah, maybe you're stuck in your conditioning also. But we're each just trying to survive. But I make it worse because you bother me. But I also need you, so I'm in, a, I'm, in a, I'm in a bind. So this, this hitting the clear button, returning to zero, suddenly there are actually smiling faces in front of me. And actually, all that irritation com comes from my discomfort inside. Whatever you do is your business. It's my reactions that cause the problem. If you read the Platform Sutra for, written by the Sixth Patriarch, time and time again, he says, don't point to the faults of others. Turn, turn the, turn, I'm gonna say it a little differently than he did, turn the finger around and look inside. What am I? Bring that great doubt back to what am I? That question is the guiding question of our lives. If we can keep that mind, then every, th every moment is a teaching moment. 
In the mornings at almost every Zen center that I know of around the world, we chant the Four Great Vows. In some of the Soto, Japanese Soto schools, the third vow, they say, Dharma gates are endless. I vow to enter them all. Each moment, we say, the teachings are endless. I vow to learn them all. Same point. But the Soto way says it very directly. Every moment is a teaching moment. Every moment is the moment to become alive and to bring this great question. And if we do that, we have a connection with our life that is much different than that life that we live in that accumulated fog. So keeping this great question is a point to orient ourselves in our practice. If we're keeping great question, every moment is practice. It's not separating our lives into the time we were, were sitting in the meditation hall and the time we're living our lives outside. It's all one life. Each moment presents a Dharma gate. Each moment we can enter. And if we keep that great doubt, then with openness and curiosity, we meet the moment. And with openness and curiosity, we learn and we respond. The second is great effort or great courage. And I particularly like this one because what I'm presenting, I'm saying it in such an easy, breezy way. Yeah, just do it. <laughs> You're laughing because you know how hard it is. Because each moment we have that possibility to, become, to be alive, to present ourselves and to respond. But oh, so often we turn ourselves away. We're afraid. We don't feel like we're enough or we don't believe in ourselves, or we, we're irritated and angry and confused. So it takes effort to show up and to pair our great question with great effort. And sometimes it's translated as great courage. And you can understand why. If we talk about all the fears, the, the concerns, the things that hold us back, it takes courage in the face of that, to step forward. I'm not even suggesting you shouldn't feel that way. All I'm saying is don't stop there. There is no courage without fear. They go hand in hand. And from the Buddhist sense of great effort, our teacher Zen Master Sung San said it, try, try, try for 10,000 years nonstop. As I understand it, in ancient China, 10,000 meant infinity. Non-stop. Show up. This is your life. Live it. Be it. Do it. And we have to show up to do that. Of course, it is a way of living to hide away. It is a way of life that most human beings live, which is to retreat. Most of us live in a world of suffering. The Buddha said there's a way out of suffering. And these three things are mark posts for us. They're practice points to help us stay on the path of awakening. So the third of these three greats, as I call them, is great faith. Great faith is a little bit tricky. I'm, I imagine the translation is not that great. Because in English, when we think of faith, especially in a spiritual tradition, we're often thinking about some deity outside of ourselves. And the Buddha wasn't all that concerned with a deity outside of himself. He didn't say yes, he didn't say no. It just wasn't of concern. He said, if you've got an arrow stuck in your chest, the best thing you can do is pull the arrow out. To be too concerned about how it got there, who did it, is it divine intervention, 
Those are good questions, and some of us are drawn to those questions. But that's not the kind of faith that we talk about when we say great faith. In some sense, we can say great faith in our true nature. We can say great faith that if we live this life, this life of great question and great effort, we can have faith that we will reveal ourselves. We will become, we will, it's so hard to find the language. We will be just now, and that's enough. And if we can have faith in our enoughness, then we're willing to be there. So in some ways, it's arbitrary to, to separate great question, great courage, and great faith. They're important teaching points. They help us keep our direction in our lives, moment to moment, hour to hour, day to day, year to year, decade to decade. If we can just follow these three things, we have a guidepost to have faith in ourselves, to have faith in that unconditioned basic nature, which we all have, to believe in that allows us to be here and to present ourselves. And it allows us to have a life that we can dedicate to living and to helping. With clarity, compassion, and wisdom, this world will change. We all want a different world, and we're all looking to other people to make that world change. But it's actually each one of us who has the responsibility to make this world different. And if we can keep this great question, great courage, and great faith, change will happen. Not that it will happen, it does happen. Of course, be careful because the one constant is that everything is always changing. <coughs> but what kind of change? If we stay lost in that accumulated fog of our irritation, anger, desire, and neediness, the way the world changes is that we grow more alienated from each other. There's more anger between people. There's more suffering that gets created. But if we can keep these guideposts of great question, great courage, and great faith, it's possible that the change in the world can be about bringing people, people, animals, nature together, rather than being self-serving all the time, our natural wisdom and compassion can grow. And if we live that, then everybody benefits. And if everybody is benefiting, the world will change in that direction. Change doesn't happen in a straight line. We need that great effort just to keep going. I've told this story many times, but it feels fitting right here, right now. In the early 90s, after um, Nelson Mandela had been let out of prison and had become the leader again in South Africa, probably before he took over as president, he came to Oakland and he gave a speech at the Oakland Coliseum. And I went and there must have been, I mean, it was full, so all 60,000 seats were full. And during one of the breaks, there were some folks sitting behind me somewhere, and I heard them talking. And they were saying, we've been working on this issue our whole lives, 30 years, never imagining that this day would come. Hoping, but losing faith, not really believing. But yet, they kept at it. We never know the results of our behaviors and our actions. We don't know where things will lead. That's this great courage or great effort. Just do it. The universe will take care of itself. Whatever happens will happen with our help, with all of our collective help. Our job is to do it. The results we'll have to deal with, but stay with it. And for a lot of us in our, in our Zen practice, 
year after year we wonder, why is this helping? Does it do anything? Suzuki Roshi, the, the founder of the San Francisco Zen Center, had a great line for this. He said, it's like getting wet in a fog. You're walking around, the fog is all around you, it's not raining, it's not that damp. You come home, you're wet. I suppose that's the gradual cultivation model of practice. In the Korean tradition, it's not an either-or proposition, it's a both-and. There is the sudden awakening of this moment, and there's the gradual cultivation of moment after moment after moment after moment after moment after moment after moment. Our job is to just do it. Sometimes we're happy, sometimes we're sad. Sometimes we get what we want, sometimes we don't get what we want. Sometimes people surprise us and thrill us, sometimes they disappoint us. That's the human condition. That's not gonna change. But how I respond can change. Like I said, I could tell you all the reasons why you piss me off and irritate me, but that's my problem. If I change that attitude, then suddenly there are 25 Buddhas sitting right in front of me. The question I have to ask myself, and really all of us have to ask each other, and really ourselves, which one do you like? There's a calligraphy hanging at the Providence Zen Center, which is our head temple in, in, the, in North America, and it says, you make, you get. You make sadness and suffering, you get sadness and suffering. You make love, wisdom, and compassion, you get love, wisdom, and compassion. Again, it doesn't say you get what you want, but our minds make the reality of our lives. I just saw a little clip of, of Viktor Frankl on the internet yesterday, and I just watched a tiny bit of it, but he said, even if you can't change your situation, you can change your attitude. We practice so that our attitude isn't locked in this fixed place, but we have freedom. Buddhism is about liberation and freedom. That's the kind of liberation and freedom we're talking about. To change our attitude, to change our minds, and to find a way to live in a world where each moment is our teacher and each moment is a chance to help and to give back. <laughs>